subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello, lovely learners. This is SHSR on Joy Learning Channel. I am your facilitator, Adraina. This is Government Year 2. You remember in our previous submissions, we talked about colonization and the processes that has to do with colonization. In our previous encounter, we talked about how our chiefs were used to get the British to rule us. Today, we'll talk about some administrative matters. The first one is the crown colony system. By the time we are done with this particular lesson, we would have been able to explain colonization. Then we'll be able to mention some major reasons for, the coloni or for colonizing Africa as a whole. Then we would have to explain, we'll be able to explain as well, what the crown colony system is. We'll be able to identify and explain to an extent the features of the Crown Colony Administrative System. I hope you have gotten that one right. Very good. Let's continue. What is colonization? I know that you, have, you treated this way you were in, when you were in JHS. So we are going to do a recap of what we did in JHS, which is nothing different. When we say colonization... We say that it is an administrative policy in which a powerful and economically endowed state creates dependencies in foreign territories and whose economic, political, and culture is adapted to serve its interests. So that is what colonization is. We say that it is when a politically and economically endowed state is able to make other states its dependencies, which means that those other states or foreign territories depend on that particular powerful state. And who, who would want that foreign, foreign state to adopt its economic, political, and cultural ways as known as colonization? I hope we've gotten that one right. Very good. Now, in the early 20th century, that is, in the, year, in, the year, in the years of 1900s, um, Sierra Leone, Gambia, Nigeria, and the Gold Coast colony had been formally colonized by the British and other territories by the French, others by the Germans, and some other places by the Netherlands. These were British, these were foreign states or foreign or European powers that had taken over the administration of some ethnic groups that were in Africa. It became a conquest for them, a kind of competition as to who was going to get more lands. And therefore, let's see why colonizing Africa was that easy for the British. The first one was that they had proud and detailed knowledge of Africa through trade. Remember that before colonization, there was a slave trade where we had sold ourselves to the British. We had been shackled and sent to be used as slaves and on plantations and in homes and foreign lands. And so before they came in to rule us through trade, they had had proud knowledge of who we are, what would make us move, what would it make us move, and therefore it was easy to colonize Africa. Then the next one was that there was lack of solidarity and unity among African states. In actual cases, when we talk about states, we are talking about ethnic groupings. And therefore, there was no unity. Now, let's take, for example, what we see here as Ghana. We have the Northern Protectorate. Um, during colonization, we have the Ashantis and the people of the South. That is the Fantis, the Ahantes, the Gans, and the Eves. And they were not united, which made it very easy for any foreign power to penetrate, using one against the other. Then there was the employment of Africans to fight for them. And between the world wars, there was where Africans were allowed to fight for foreign, um, foreign states, um, specifically the European nations. And therefore, 
it made them easy to also um, capitalize on these factors and colonize us. Then there was lack of material and economic resources of Africa, where economically, um, because there was no, there was not the money economy and the rest, materially we were used to some primitive forms of living. Though it was all right with us, we were not complaining, were we? Yet, um, when we saw these foreigners come in with sophisticated materials and, and resources, we, we fell in love with them. And therefore, it made them easy. It made it easy for them to colonize us. Another reason why they colonized us so easily was the, was the advent of Christianity in Africa. Sorry. It was the, ad, it was the advent of Christianity and Islam in Africa where we were taught that we were to be subdued, we were to be humble, we were to be humble, and all those virtues. And that got us humble enough for a foreign power to colonize us. Then came westernized education, where we, we preferred to um, do certain things in, in forms that were alien to us. And, and therefore, it also made it easy for us to be colonized, or for Africa to be colonized. Then there was a the use of sophisticated weapons. Truth be told, before colonization, if our forefathers were to be here, we should be asking them what kind of weapons they used. I guess they were to be clubs, um, some crude forms of cutlasses and the rest, and maybe an arrow or kind of. Today we see sophisticated weapons like um, machine guns, cannons, cannonballs, um, the gun, shotgun, different types of them, isn't it? And therefore, the introduction of them into our world gave them the advantage over us, or the advantage of the African, and got us getting them to colonize Africa. Then they had discovered quinine. Well, most of us didn't come to meet quinine. It was an anti-malaria drug. When they had come to do trade with us, the mosquitoes had not made it any easy for them. And so then they had gone in to do more investigations and more research and had developed quinine. And therefore it made them easier to stay here the more so that they could continue with the activity of colonization. So now let's talk about some major reasons for colonization. So what I said earlier on or what we explained earlier on was what made it easy for them to colonize us. Now let's talk about the reasons. Africa is endowed with a lot of raw materials. Take Ghana, for example. At the moment, we are even sourcing more crude oil, isn't it? Go to Nigeria, there's more crude oil. Um, you come to Ghana, you get um, more raw materials like um, herbs, or we say leaves, or trees for medicines. We'll talk about locks for paper. We'll talk about locks for the building of, or for the creating of beautiful furniture. We talk about gold, bauxite, manganese, diamonds, and a lot more. And therefore, it was a way by which, after subduing the African, would get the Africans to give up raw materials for the industries they have um, created in the European nations. Remember, it was the Industrial Revolution back then, and they have been able to um, get to know how to make finished goods out of raw materials. And they've desecrated or possibly they have taken off all that they had and wanted places where they could get more raw materials into their industries. And Africa was there, ready to be exploited. Then they also had another economic reason, that there was new and ready markets for their finished product. I, I think that in our earlier discussion, we've said that the African... Uh, before colonization, they didn't know so many things, like the creation of fabric, um, television sets, how to make toffee or candy, chocolate, the processed types. And so the, 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 the coming of the Europeans to our land brought these finished products, and we're ready to patronize them. Chamber pots made from brass, bottles made from glass, you know, the beauty of the world. And it got us running into their hands. Then we have investments for their surplus capital. They had, they had had so much capital from the sale of finished products from their industries. And therefore, they needed places where they could invest their surplus capital. 
and Africa was ready. And that is how they were able to colonize Africa. Socially, it was an outlet also for their surplus labor. Remember, they've been able to do machines. So what, what um, people or labor from humans could do, machines were doing them in their end. So what were they, how were they going to talk about issues of employment or employment for their people? So they pushed all the bulk of their surplus labor to Africa so that they could take up managerial positions in Africa. And that is how they got to colonize in Africa. It was also to prevent internal slave trade. Even after the abolition of the slave trade, there was still some form of slave trade businesses being done in uh, some parts of Africa. And that was an intention of this to make sure that there was no longer slave trade in Africa. Another reason why, or social reason why they colonized Africa was to spread the European culture. And I guess that one day they, they actually were able to do it. The wearing of shirts and trousers and, and the tie and the shirts and all those things that came with modernization from the European world got to us. And that was another way by which we, by which reasons why Africa was colonized. Then the desire to civilize Africa. When they had come in to trade with the African people, they had realized that most of their culture to them was barbaric, uncivilized, outmoded, old-fashioned. So another way by which they were, reasons why they wanted to colonize us was to push onto the African their kind of culture which they deemed civilized. And that is one way by which they got Africa colonized. Then politically, they were in search for national glory and prestige. That among the European powers, like I said earlier, when you were able to colonize or you were able to take over a particular foreign territory in Africa, it was a sign of prestige and glory. And that was what pushed them to colonize Africa. Another reason why they came in to colonize was to search for new lands, new places where somehow would say some of their places had been overpopulated and therefore they wanted to search for new lands to adjourn them or to make them um, some form of annex to their main countries. It was also to maintain the balance of power in Europe. That said and done, we'll talk about a religious reason. Remember that during colonial, possibly before trade, or possibly during the slave trade, there are priests from some religious denominations had come into Africa. They had come in somehow to sort of abolish some inhuman features of the African culture. And so when they had come, they had come in with their colonial ideas, kind of, to protect their people who were coming in to civilize Africa. So in effect, we said that they were there to provide safety and protection for their people who had come in to colonize or to spread the good news of the gospel. Let's talk about events leading to the colonization of Africa. Between 1884 and 1885, an international conference of European powers scrambling for African territories were put together by Bismarck, the then Chancellor of Germany. And so between this time, Bismarck was then a Chancellor of Germany. He had summoned all European powers, the British, the Danes, the Dutch, um, the Germans, and all of them, and France together. And they had had a conference. It was known as the Berlin Conference. And it was to address issues of rivalries and conflicts amongst themselves. And so at this particular conference, their main idea was to deal with the rivalry that was between the British, the Germans, the France, or the French, who had placed um, their, their rule or possibly their hands on some territories as their own. 
At a point in time, they were fighting amongst each other as to who controlled which territory within Africa. During this conference, it was agreed by all who were present that there must be establishment of peace and order in the colonies. All right. So when it came to the colony, the colonies were those foreign territories over which a greater power had um, authority over. Is that all right? And so these colonies, within these colonies, it was, it was agreed at the Berlin Conference that there must be an establishment of peace and order. And if peace and order was going to work, then there was going to be a creation of colonial administrative for effective occupation. So then if you are going to administer your colonies, then you are going to put down administrative measures so that you could occupy those words, those colonies. You cannot live somewhere and administer your colonies. You are supposed to occupy the colonies so that all European bodies or all European states who were also interested in that particular colony knew that there was a colonial owner or a colonial master who administered over that particular colony. Then European states were to notify each other of claims of ownership of some territories in Africa. So if it was the British that took over a particular territory, he was to tell other European nations that I have taken this territory, so this is mine, to prevent the rivalry. And then they were in one of their resolution of the Berlin Conference was to make sure that slave trade was abolished, that no foreign nation took part in slave trade. So the British was ready. And like I said before, it had occupied Sierra Leone, had occupied the Gambia, Nigeria, and what we called the Gold Coast Colony. Now the Gold Coast Colony became late, came later, was drawn, the map was later drawn with the help of Ekem Ferguson, who was a Winniberian, somebody from Winneba. And what had happened was that at that point in time, between 1919, I guess when you went to JHS, you were told that that was when the Yaa Santua War was fought. That was when they had subdued the Ashantis and had sent some of their chiefs, including their queen mothers, to Seychelles, an island somewhere. Is that right? And so at that point in time, the British were ready to colonize what is now known as Ghana. But were colonized, or Ghana as it is, was colonized differently based on the behavior and conduct of the people who lived there. The Fantis were more calmer, but were, would, would, were, were ready to go for protection from the British because the Ashantis and the Aquamus and the rest were not allowing them to have their peace of mind. The Fantis wanted to control the trade routes to the seaside, to trade directly with... Um, they wanted to, to control the trade routes that were... were, were were paved directly so that you could deal with the British traders. And the Ashantis were not ready to pay for the taxes the Fantis imposed. And therefore, there was always the war. And so the Fantis, the Gans, the Adangbes, and some parts of the Western region went to, their, uh, went to the British for protection. In the getting of the protection, they were allowed or they were asked to sign bonds or agreements. These agreements meant that I will protect you, but you would have to agree to some of my, my wishes, that you will not be able to do this. You will not be able to do that. By so doing, they imposed their power over them. Then the Ashantis were also colonized differently because they were the warring tribes. I will not allow you to take them for granted. So they fought them in several wars. We'll talk about them later. And at the end of the day, they were conquered. And therefore, they took over Ashanti, we call Ashanti by conquest. Then the Northerners, who were a little afraid of the Ashantis because they were the warring tribes, were instigated by Ekem Ferguson to run to the Ashantis for protection. For British Togoland, after a world war was fought, the Second World War was fought, Germany lost. There were two opposing sides in Europe. And so Germany fought and had to lose all its colonies in Africa. And so at that time, the UN demanded or said that um, 
the French and the British to divide, were to divide Togo into two, and were to become trustees. They were not owners. They were entrusted with these half colonies and other colonies of Germans so that they would oversee to the smooth administration of those areas. And so that is how Ghana was colonized in totality. It was so because they were bent on imposing their power on Africa. One of the ways by which they did it was the institution of an administrative form known as the Crown Colony System or the Crown Colony System. It was known as the Crown Colony System. Let's see what it is. It is explained as a political and administrative system in which any territory under the British monarch, which was acquired through settlement, conquest, seizure, or purchase, was a subject of British rule and sovereignty, but not part of Britain. Have we understood this? That it was a political and administrative system in which any territory that was either acquired through settlement, through a war, through seizure or was purchased was a subject of British rule. It means that if you were in, let's say, Gold Coast, you had to adhere, you would be ruled with British laws, but you were not part of Great Britain. Have we understood it? Then you should also note that this was done to implement the policies adopted at the Berlin Conference. So right after the Berlin Conference, the British decided that they were going to use the crown colony system. That even though they were far away overseas, their overseas colonies will be administered with British rule, but will not be part of Britain. So we're not known as British citizens. Let's look at the hierarchy of the crown colony. At the very apex was the British monarch. In those days, there were the kings and the queens, and they were the administrators of the colonies. Now, when we talk about the Secretary of State for the colonies, he or she was um, a minister or possibly he was a member of the British Parliament. Is that right? He was a member of the British Parliament, which means that he was a parliamentarian. At the same time, he was a member of the British Cabinet. When we talk about cabinets, we say this is an advisory body or in Britain, it was, it's a governing body. All right? That was made up of possibly the prime minister and ministers who administered the state. And therefore, his position as a minister, a ministerial position he held, was the Secretary of State for the Colonies. All right? Then, then came the governor. The governor was appointed by the British Parliament upon the recommendation of the Secretary of State. Under him were the Executive Council and the Legislative Council. Later on, under the hierarchy came the Provincial Councils and the Chiefs of the chiefs and more. So this is how the crown colony system looks like. The crown colony system makes use of the British monarch. Then comes the secretary of state of the colonies. Then there was the governor. Then there was the executive and the legislative council. We'll take them one after the other and see what is there. The British monarch. I guess in one of our, our discussions, we've talked about monarchy. We said it is a system of government that makes use of what? Kings, queens, empress, mm -hmm, and the rest. And so when we talk about the British monarchy, it is a kind of or a system of government ruled and reigned over by a king or a queen. At the top of the hierarchy was the monarch who was the ruler of Great Britain and all acquired territories. So all the territories belonged to the monarch. Is that okay with us? All territories, Sierra Leone, India, Nigeria, Gold Coast, the Gambia, and a host of more of them belonged to the British monarch. The monarch performed ceremonial functions in the colonies. So like we said, if it has to do with ceremonial functions, a special day in any of the colonies, it was the monarch who performed them. We'll now talk about the Secretary of State for the Colonies. I have already told you that he was a minister appointed by the British Parliament 
to administer all, all of Britain's foreign territories. So he lived in Britain and occasionally would visit his colonies or the colonies. So all these colonies were under his main job was to administer British or Britain's foreign colonies. Is that okay? Are we there? Good. We say he was a minister appointed by the British Parliament. And all he did was to administer all of Britain's foreign territories. Which Gold Coast was one. Nigeria was another. Sierra Leone in Africa. Sierra Leone was another. The Gambia was another. His roles include... He was an advisor to the monarch on appointment, promoting and transfer of governors. So what he did was that he advised the monarch on who to appoint as a governor of a particular colony. He, he helped in promoting them as well as in transferring governors when it was necessary. He was also in charge of approval of new constitutions for the colony. So it was not the governor, but it was the secretary of state for the colonies who approved any new constitution for any of the colonies. He also possesses the power to set up commissions of inquiry into any disturbances in the colonies. So at any point in time, if there was a problem in any of the colonies, it was the Secretary of State of the Colonies who decided to set an inquiry to investigate the cause of the disturbance and the actions to take. Let's look at his functions. So first of all, we say he was an advisor. First of all, we've already said it, that he's an advisor to the monarch. He was also the advisor of the governors of the colonies. So the governors of all the colonies. Every colony had its own governor. All right? They were changed just like presidents are changed, isn't it? But for them, they are appointed by the British government. And when they come into the colony, it is the Secretary of State of the colonies that advised them on issues of governance. He also controlled finance with respect to the individual or respective colonies. When the colonies had problems, petitions from the colonies were addressed to him. So in the past when we were writing letters, when their ship came in, if a ship came in to birth, in Gold Coast. If he had letters, he sent it through the post, through the, the passage of, of the sea to the Secretary of State of the Colonies. And he would address it as and when it became necessary. Then there was the control of governors. It was the power, it was within the powers and authority of the Secretary of State of the Colonies to control the activities of the governors. He decided which actions they could take at any point in time. And that was one of his major functions. He also detected the pace of development or developmental projects within the colonies. In actual cases, we say that it was a secretary of state who determined at what pace a particular developmental project was supposed to be finished or to start or to be initiated. And that was some of his functions. Let's talk about the governor. The governor, like Ghana, I think that um, the Gold Coast colony, in effect, when it became a full colony, had the advantage of having several of them, starting from George McLean through to Gorges, Gorges Bay, Gordon Gorgesbeck, sorry, and others. Now, when we say the governor, we say the governor was appointed by the British government upon the recommendations by the Secretary of State. So the British government determined who became governor over any of the colonies. Remember that the governor was a British, a white British, and therefore came from Britain and was appointed by the British government upon the recommendation of the Secretary of State. The governor was stationed in the colony and directly administered it. So all governors that got into any of the colonies or were stationed in any of the colonies were living within the colonies, not like the Secretary of State of the colonies who lived in Britain and gave orders from Britain. This time, the governor lived in the colony and directly administered it. Then he was responsible the, to the British government through the Secretary of State. At every point in time, 
the Secretary of State would appear before the British government and would answer questions with regard to the colonies based on what the governor had proudly informed him of. Let's look at the functions of the governor. The governor of the colony was responsible for formulating and implementing of policies that had to do with the colonies. So if there was a policy to be implemented, if there was a policy to be formulated, he sat with the legislative, as sorry, he sat with the executive as uh, council. If there was any policy to be formulated, he sat with the executive council at that time and they sat and formulated policy. And then the civil service of that particular administration implemented the policies through the chiefs. Then he was also responsible for the appointing of personnel. Now there were some departments. In Ghana today would have called the ministries. There were departments and still in Britain they have departments. What it means is that he appointed the key officials or the heads of these um, departments. And sometimes we say that he also appointed other personnel with regards to governance. And that helped him to administer the colony. He was also the president of the legislative and executive council. A little autocratic in nature, isn't it? But then that is what it was. That within the legislative council, he was the president or the chairman. And in the executive council, he was also the chairman. He had powers to legislate as well as to execute and formulate policies. He also performed judicial functions. In cases that had to do with um, crimes of aggravating nature, it was sent to the governor to make sure that there was um, justice in the colony. Another function of the governor was that he presented the annual report to the Secretary of State of the Colony. An annual report today would have been like the State of the Nation's Address to talk about what happens within the colonies between the time of assumption of office and where he was being asked. Occasionally when there was an issue within the colonies, he was asked to present reports to make up for that particular disturbance. In actual cases, even though he was not part, he was, though he was part of the Legislative Assembly, he made recommendations to the changes in the Constitution. There were several constitutions that were written before we gained independence. And therefore, for each one of them, the governor had the right, he had the power, authority as well, to make changes in the constitution when he deemed fit. Then he exercised what we call the veto and reserved rights. These reserved rights are what we call power of certification, which would mean that when the Legislative Assembly had denied or had said that or had rejected a particular bill, he had the right to make that bill into a law. That is what we call power of certification. He had the power to make a law that has been rejected by the Legislative Council. A, a bill that had been rejected by the Legislative Council can be passed into a law by the governor. Then he had what we call the veto right, where he could veto any legislative and uh, uh, sorry he could veto any legislative decision as well as any executive decision has that one also gone down well he had also the right to recognize chiefs you remember that the last submission we said that the chiefs at a point in time were now normal subjects to the governors they were treated as normal citizens and no longer um, monarchs any longer. So for a chief to be known in the colony, the governor must first of all recognize you and must have gazetted you, must have accepted that you are a what? A chief before you could act as one. Let's look at the limitations to the power of the governor. We already know that the governor is appointed by the British government upon the recommendation of the words of the Secretary of State of the Colonies. So let's look at some of the limitations or restraints he, restraints he had on his powers. One, the, the Secretary of State had the right 
to deny or to reject any of the submissions of the governor. And therefore, he could advise against any action the governor took. Then, remember that uh, back then, the British people were keenly interested in what happened in the colonies under the British government. So if anything went wrong here, the British government allowed, possibly the British people, had the right to voice out the opinion. So we said that public opinion of the British people also limited the power of the governor. Then the educated elites. Who are the educated elites? These were people who during or before colonization had had the chance to attend formal education in some foreign countries such as Britain, Germany, France, and the rest, and had come back to their colonies as educated elites, but had, do not have or did not have the chance to assume offices under the British colony. And so they could also speak. First of all, remember that because they have been there, they had learned to speak the white man's language. And so they could oppose some of the policies of the British. And that was a limitation on the power of the governor. Then the petition of the natives of the colony. The people of the colony, with the help of the educated elites, would write letters to the Secretary of State of the colonies. And upon recommendation, could cause the removal of a particular governor and to be replaced by another governor. And that alone was a restraint or was a restraint or limitation of the powers of the governor. Remember when we looked at the hierarchy, at the two tail ends, we saw the executive council. When we talk about the executive, we say it is an organ of government that is what responsible for what? Implementation, formulating, um, what else? Decision making of the states. Very good. In the same way, in the Crown Colony system, the Executive Council, the Executive Council would now be known, or it is now known as the cabinet of the presidential system. It was purely, it was their, their functions are similar. So we said that the Executive Council under the Crown Colony system was a purely an advisory body of the governor of the colony. So just like today, in the past, the Executive Council was an advisory body set up or was, was appointed by the governor to advise him on issues of formulating and implementation of the policies for that particular colony. Until 1992, it was a body made up of it was a body made up of white British officials. Until 1942, from 1919 to 1942, the Executive Council was made up of all white British officials. These were British nationals who were appointed by the governor and was, were brought all the way from Britain to the colonies. And they advised the governor on issues of administration. The members helped the governor to formulate and implement policies for the colony. However, the governor was not bound by the advice of the executive council, just like today, that if the executive council made a suggestion, the governor could either ignore or pretend that they never were there and use his veto to do what he wanted. So from the beginning of colonization, the executive council were made up of official members who had voting rights. So when we now talk about official members, we are talking about members of a particular council that have the right to make inputs. There's a difference between being part of a deliberative um, council or a deliberative body, but not being able to either say I agree or not to agree is, is, is a little hard, isn't it? So when it comes to the official members, they have voting rights. These official members consisted of principal or key officials of the governor. They were appointed by the governor of the colony. With the exception of the attorney general, who was the only official appointed by the colonial office in London. So this is the executive council that existed between 1919, or possibly earlier, to 1942. The governor was the chairman. 
It consisted of official members who were the colonial secretary, the attorney general, director of medical services, officer commanding the local troops, and the treasurer. Note, all these officials were official members. So officer commanding the local troops, it meant that there was an army here made up of local people. I don't know, possibly by that time you guys had were still young. There was a, a comedy that was, was being shown on one of our television um, stations where we would find um, a, a, a white man being the judge and I think Mr. Lane was, uh, was the interpreter of that particular, uh, that particular uh, comedy. He interpreted what the black said to the white judge. And you could see colonial dressing of our troops where they had a hard hat on, a long sock stretching all the way to the knee, and something else as sandals. And these were the local troops. But the officer who commanded them was an all-white. And these were the executive of the executive council. In 1942, changes were made to include native educated personnel because the people had begun to agitate that it was our nation, it was our state, this was our land. And if we were to make if we were to make policies, if we were to formulate policies, we were supposed to be responsible. And so because of what the natives said were time, they included two unofficial members, which means that these unofficial members had no voting rights. In 1942, they added Se Akukosa. Se Akukosa. Then, in that same year, they added Nana Se Ufuriata. And then in 1943, they, they added Nanatsi So these three were the men who were added until a later date when another executive council made up of all blacks was instituted. With time as we neared self-rule, the number of Africans on the executive council changed to allow more natives to participate in government. Let's look at their functions. Functions of the executive council. They assisted and advised the governor in the formulation and implementation of colonial policies. They, had, they were the controllers or they controlled and supervised departments to execute colonial policies. So if you looked at what we saw earlier on, we saw there was the director of medical services, which is a department, and this was the head. Then the officer commanding the local troop, this was the head. They would talk about the attorney general. These were heads. And so they they were, there was a control and supervision of departments to execute colonial policies. Then they initiated the budget statement to the legislative assembly for approval. So now that we are done with the executive council, let's talk about the legislative council. The legislative council... As, as we know what legislature is, we say that the, to legislate means to make what? To make laws, isn't it? I think we've learned that in Form 1. To legislate, to make laws. Now, today, our legislative council is known as parliament. But between 1919 to 1945, we had what we call the legislative council. And periodically, there were changes, especially when there was a change in the constitution, which was used back then. Now, the Legislative Council was made up of two components, official members and unofficial members. The official members had voting rights. The unofficial members would take part in deliberations and debates, but had no voting rights. So in 1919 to 1925, there was the existence of the 1916 Constitution. A constitution before formally, we began to, the British began to colonize the Gold Coast, all right, so was a constitution. There was already a constitution in use, and it was written in 1916. It made allowance for 20 members into the legislative assembly. Now, when we look at the composition of the legislative assembly, there were 11 official members with voting rights. 
These officials were all white British nationals who were heads of important departments in the colony and appointed by the governor. And if we had seen, we'd have seen that the director for medical services was part, um, the commander commanding, the official commanding the local troops was one, and there was a treasurer as also part of the official members. Almost everybody in the executive council was also part of the legislative official members side. Then there were none when there were nine unofficial members. Three were Europeans representing special interests such as banking, commerce, and, and mining. Three Europeans representing special interests, banking, commerce, industry, and mines. Three were paramount chiefs, and three were given to educated seats were given to educated elites. Then between 1925 to 1945, that was where the Gold Coast saw a change in their constitution under the Gordon Gorgesbeck administration. And this new constitution was written in 1925. It elevated the legislative council to 29 members. 15 were official members. These official members were all white British nationals. They were all appointed by the governor and they were all heads of colonial departments. The other 14, we've talked about 15, isn't it? The other 14 were unofficial members. Five were from European, five were Europeans representing special interests. Six were paramount chiefs. Three were educated elites. Five Europeans were all appointed by the governor. However, the chiefs were appointed by that constitution. It allowed that the chiefs were appointed by the provincial council under the Gorgesbeck constitution. The educated elites were directly elected by the property owners from the municipalities. Have we understood it now? So the 14 here now has to do with the paramount chiefs from the provincial council that was set up under the Gorgesbeck constitution. And the educated allies or elites were now from, they were property owners. A kind of restricted franchise, isn't it? So they were from property, they were directly elected by the property owners from the municipalities. Their functions was that they were responsible for the making of ordinances or laws to administer the, col the colony. They were responsible for making ordinances, which are laws to administer the colonies. They were responsible for making laws that were used to administer the colonies. Then, like what we see today in our parliament, they were responsible for approving bills initiated by the executive council. And then, they also provided an avenue to enable the governor to hear the grievances of the people. So for any time the people begin to agitate, uh, it gave the, the legislative council the advantage. It was always present at their meetings to hear what the people had to say. Another function of the legislative council was to settle dis chieftaincy disputes and land litigations. So any time chiefs had issues with boundaries of their, their jurisdiction, um, had to do with who owned which kinds of land, it was the legislative council that helped in settling these cases. It was also a deliberative body. They deliberated on matters that had to do with governance. Let's talk about how the, elect the legislative council was controlled. Control of the Legislative Council. There was an act. There was an act that was passed in 1865, known as the Colonial Validity Act of 1865. There was an act known as the Colonial Validity Act of 1865. It was mandatory for territories 
to pass laws that are consistent with the British laws. Okay, this particular act was such that the colonies under the legislative assembly or the legislative council had to pass laws that were consistent with the British laws of Great Britain, even though that this was not Britain, every law made within the colonies, whether in Gambia, whether in Sierra Leone, whether in Nigeria, whether in Ghana, must be consistent. And if they were not consistent, the British Parliament had every right to squash it. That means to abolish it without making it, allowing it to grow. And therefore, that was one of the control the system had on the Legislative Council between 1919 to 1942 or 45. Then there was a veto of the governor. Where we said that the governor would override decisions and legislations of the Legislative and Executive Council and decide what he wanted to do. And then there was the power of certification. As we mean that the Legislative Council had promulgated or had um, worked on a particular bill and had said that it was not going to work, the governor of the colonies could control the legislative assembly by the power of certification. By passing that law, that particular, sorry, by passing that particular bill to become a law, even though it has been rejected by the legislative council of the colony. There was official control of the secretary of state of the colony where he could control from Britain the legislative assembly. The governor had the power to initiate money bills. When we say money bill, money bill is a budget. What is a budget? A budget is a plan of expenditure, uh, income and what? Expenditure. What I plan to have or how I plan to get money and how I intend to say money bills, we say it is the national budget. Now this bill under normal circumstances should have been um, initiated by the minister with regards to finance. But then it is the governor who as a member of the legislative assembly or the legislative council also initiated money bills and could use his veto to get it um, approved. Then the drafting of bills was done by the Secretary of State of the Colonies. He sat in Britain and drafted bills at will. He brought it down for the Legislative Assembly or the Legislative Council to work on it. Then the casting of votes. The governor was, was, had two voting rights. One, he had the veto rights to vote as well as what we call the original rights. And so when there was Let's say he had joined a particular party and had voted. When there was a tie, he could join any other party within the Legislative Assembly to break the tie. And that was a control on the power of the Legislative Council between 1919 to 1942 and beyond, possibly towards um, self-rule or independence. So today, we have gotten to know why, we, why the African continent, with the exception of a few, two states that were not colonized, why it became easy for European powers to colonize Africa. Major reasons that made them come into Africa. And then also, um, what happened with the, in the Berlin Conference and, uh, um, before colonization, and the steps the British took to occupy its colonies in Africa, specifically in West Africa. And so I guess that this had gone down well. If you had some challenges, you can look at, see these references on the screen, and then you can read well. So that the next time I come, I would give you an exercise so that your government teachers would help us answer them or would help you to answer them. All too soon, we have come to the end of today's presentation. And I hope that everything had gone down well. With time, possibly, we'll get the chance to answer some of the challenges we have. But until then, and until the next time we meet for another presentation, it's goodbye and stay safe.
subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.